I think a lot of people also have been sick for so long that they don't understand what it feels like to be healthy. I absolutely agree. It's it's human nature to get used to where we're at. Yeah. Right. And I and so you see this on both sides of the coin. When somebody's miserable every day, I didn't realize how good I could feel without joint yeah. pain and rosacea and, and severe heartburn and, and Dunlap. Do you know what Dunlap is, Michaela? Here in the South. Yeah, it sounds that's, horrifying. That, it, it is. It's when your belly is Dunlapped over your belt. That's a Southernism that we say here. And that means you're fat. I didn't, I didn't realize how miserable I was until I corrected all those things. Welcome to episode 117 of the Michaela Peterson podcast, featuring the one and only Dr. Ken Berry. Dr. Berry is a doctor who specializes in the carnivore diet and keto diets. He's incredibly knowledgeable, one of the most knowledgeable doctors in this area that exists out there. And his last name is Barry, so that's funny. We talk about lies we've been told about health and how to transition to a healthy lifestyle. This guy's the best selling author of Lies My Doctor Told Me and I support what he does. I'm also slowly convincing him to try the lion diet. If you want to learn about how to get healthier in a way that actually works, check this episode out. If you enjoy it, please hit subscribe. Dr. Ken Berry, welcome to my podcast. Hey, Michaela, thank you so much. I feel like the last time we spoke, I did a live on your Facebook or something like that. Yeah, I think we did a live, maybe on YouTube and Facebook. And uh, that's been a minute, though. It's about time for us to converse again. Yes. So before we get started, for anyone who doesn't know you, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Sure. I'm Dr. Ken Berry. I'm a family physician, classically trained in allopathic medicine. I've uh, been, been in active practice for about 21 years now, and uh, I have a YouTube channel uh, that I'm trying to grow. I've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the things. I'm even on TikTok. Are you on TikTok, Michaela? You should be. I am on TikTok. Excellent. How do you okay. feel about TikTok? I'll go check out your TikTok. But the mm-hmm. reason I'm on all those social media platforms is because I, I have to go to where the people are to help them understand the lessons that I learned in my own journey, first of all, towards severe chronic illness, and then uh, doing the 180 away from that back to what I would consider fairly close to optimal health as a 52 year old. And so uh, the things I learned along that journey, and the things that I saw reflected in my patients, when they changed their diet, that's kind of compelled me some would say called me to to kind of focus all my effort on reaching out to the the millions of people who who suffer from chronic disease, chronic inflammation, obesity, type two diabetes, fatty liver, uh, you know, auto autoimmune conditions. That all of these things are at least to some degree reversible by eating a proper human diet. And so, it really, uh, I'm on fire for that, and have been for the last three or four years, and I don't see any plans in the future to stop doing that because it's, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor. I'm supposed to make people better. I'm not supposed to medicate them. I'm not supposed to tell them there's no hope. I'm supposed to give them hope and then also give them a path that they can follow and, and also introduce them to a tribe of other people who have had similar problems and similar journeys and say, hey, we all we all got better and you can too. That is what I like to hear from a doctor. What else would a doctor say? I know, I know, I know. Uh, They say lots of things. I know. They say, yeah, they they say you're you're chronically ill and there's nothing you can do about it and here's some pills. You're just unlucky. Bye. Screwed. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that even if a patient is screwed, I think there's always hope for at least some degree of improvement. And that's the that's the thing that we need to focus on. Not the fact, you know, if the odds are bad, why focus on that? Because you're not in any way helping the patient. Every interaction between a a patient and a doctor or in between a YouTuber and a watcher should be therapeutic. It should be uh, an opportunity to instill some hope, however small the hope. There should always be hope involved and there should always be a path. This worked for me. This has worked for thousands or tens of thousands of people. You should try this. 
So what happened to you? You said you had chronic health issues? Yeah. So as a, as a young uh, teenager and, and a young man, I was very slender, very seemingly very healthy. I just ate a complete junk food diet. I was, you know, going through medical school and residency. I didn't have time definitely to cook, but really didn't have time to, to think about food at that point. And my body had not given me enough negative feedback yet that I knew that that was important. Uh, but uh, when I got out of residency, started my very active practice, I was working in the emergency department uh, two to four nights a week. And so I might get an hour or two of sleep. Oh. And then also running a full time Monday through Friday family practice. I quickly started to gain weight, wow. get inflamed, miserable joint pain. I, de- I, I became at, at my worst morbidly obese. I was just over the, the criteria for being diagnosed as morbidly obese. I was pre-diabetic. I had severe GERD heartburn. I had rosacea, chronic joint pain, and was just getting fat and miserable. And uh, you might be able to tell from what little accent I do have that I'm from the South. And the, the people in the South I grew up around were very common sense people. Uh, you couldn't be a mechanic and be successful if your car wouldn't start. People judge you on that here. You couldn't be a hairdresser and be successful if your hair was ratchet, right? You had to have you had to have nice hair to be a successful hairdresser. And in the same respect, you couldn't be a fat, miserable, sick doctor. People would be like, "Okay, doctor, you you told me I need to lose weight," and their eyes would would for one second, go down and look at my belly where the button over my um, uh, um, um, umbilicus was in danger of popping at any second, they would judge me. And I felt that judgment. And I think that was therapeutic judgment because it, it cast a light on me. Dude, you're not you're not being consistent. You're being very inconsistent. You're fat and pre-diabetic, but yet you're going to tell this person what's wrong with them. And so I, I could not tolerate the incongruity of that. I had to fix that. And so I started out with, with primal paleo type diets. They maybe helped a little in the process of doing that. I discovered this thing called a ketogenic diet. And so I thought, well, I'll try that for a few months. And that immediately started the weight loss my hemoglobin A1C, which is the primary marker used for type 2 diabetes that doctors look at, it started to come down precipitously. All of my symptoms of heartburn, joint pain, inflammation, rosacea, dandruff, skin tags, all of that stuff started to get better on this ketogenic diet. And in the process, I was I was reading about uh, your your dad, Jordan Peterson. He's he's you know doing this carnivore diet. And I'm like, that's interesting because that's as low carb as you can possibly get, right? And then I saw this crazy Dr. Sean Baker, an orthopedic surgeon. He's doing this carnivore diet. And so on my Facebook page, I just I just issued a challenge. I said, hey guys, let's do 30 days of this carnivore diet. Let's see what happens. And so when I tell you I had heartburn, it was severe, almost disabling. It was so severe. I had to take two Nexium, which is a very strong prescription medication for um, GERD. I had to take two a day. So when the drug rep came to drop off the Nexium samples, the patients didn't get those. I got all those. Those were mine because I needed two a day. And so I'm going to have to do that plus some tons of Rolaids or some other antacid uh, during the day. It affected my ability to speak. It affected my ability to to breathe and and swallow at the same time. It was really it was really bad. So on a ketogenic diet full of real whole one ingredient foods, not all the keto shakes and cakes and cookies and pies, but real keto food, my heartburn, which was severe, 10 out of 10 got 80% better. And I'm like, huh. At that point, I didn't know enough. I hadn't reached out to enough people to know that that wasn't just an anecdotal weird thing that happened to me. That's something that very commonly happens for people with severe reflux when they start a ketogenic diet. But then when I did my one month carnivore challenge, at the end of that month, I realized I hadn't taken a single thing for heartburn that entire month. Uh, which was very unusual 
for me. And so I thought, you know, that's really cool, but also very weird. Mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to do this carnivore another month. So I let everybody on my Facebook page off the hook. They could go back to their keto if they wanted to, but I stuck with carnivore and have been a carnivore now for 28, 29 months. And at this point, I have no intentions of ever going back. And occasionally I'll cheat on carnivore with keto for an anniversary or a birthday or some family get together, but on a daily basis, consistently, I eat an all, it's an animal based diet for me. And, and that I, I have not had any heartburn in 29 months, which is if anybody listening has suffered from severe heartburn, severe GERD reflux, that's miraculous to say I have not had a single symptom in 29 months. Wow. I am very glad to hear that. Me too. Yeah, that's fantastic. I've been I've been doing it since December 2017. And I've tried a couple of times. I'm okay, for uh, before, before we get into that, what does your diet look like specifically? What's animal based look like for you? What's like a daily daily meals? What does that look like? So it, it's there's always a, a large serving of some meat. Uh routinely I can I can eat eggs just fine. Some people on carnivore, depending on why they're doing it, may or may not be able to include eggs. I found that many people <clears throat> who think they're allergic to eggs, it's actually the egg white. If they'll mm-hmm. just stick to the yolk, they they don't have any inflammatory symptoms at all. And so for uh, I typically don't break my fast until one or two or 3 p.m. every day. I'm just not hungry. I don't think about it. I've got stuff to do. I've got lots of farm chores outside. I've got, you know, the uh, people to reach, people to help. And so it's somewhere between 1 and 4 p.m., I'll be like, oh, I haven't eaten today. And so I'll go have maybe a, a, a 12 ounce ribeye with um, seven or eight egg yolks scrambled. And that, that'll be my breakfast for that day. I can include some dairy. Always full fat, real good quality dairy. If if I get too far off into the dairy, I'll start to notice some inflammation in different parts of my body. So a, a tiny bit of, of cheese, a tiny bit of heavy cream, but the vast majority of my diet is uh, is is meat and eggs. I I notice I do better on ruminant meat. So beef, goat, sheep. Uh, venison is fine. Um, uh, even elk is fine. All the, it seems that all the ruminant meat so has some magical quality for me. I, I just feel better. I'm more mentally clear when I eat ruminant meat. I can tolerate some chicken and some pork, but if I if I eat too much of that, I just don't feel my best. And I don't necessarily think that chicken and pork are bad. I just think for me personally, they're less good. I react terribly to pork, like terribly to pork. I can eat a lot of plants easier than than pork. That gives me really bad autoimmune symptoms. Yeah, and I think weirdly that's a great enough, lesson, and I think everyone should experiment with their diet because you you've discovered that about yourself, and and it is true that we're all at, to some degree uh, biogenetically unique and different. Uh, I think the gut microbiome, which we don't know nearly enough about, I think that also plays a role. Probably your your ancestral heritage, your DNA plays some degree of a role. I don't think we know one of those to talk about them with confidence. But it's great that you know that that now, you know, I might, I can have a, a bite of bacon, but if I get crazy on the bacon, I'm going to suffer. Whereas I, I can eat six pieces of bacon and, and, and eggs and it's no big deal for me. But I think that, that, that is important for people to understand that there is some diversity between us, although we are all 99.9% the same genetically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, if everybody was as sensitive as my dad and I, then there'd be, We'd be like the population would look a little different. Yeah. Okay, so I think we should address some like common concerns for people if they're not familiar with the carnivore diet, although if they've been watching my channel, they probably are. But for people who say suffer from kidney disease or heart disease or high cholesterol, do those people have to be worried switching on to something that's animal based? No. Next question. No, let me go into that a little bit. So, no, you don't. And so 
there's a huge myth in the medical community, which should not be susceptible to mythology. They should focus and, and act only on facts, only on evidence. But there's this huge misconception in the medical community that a diet high in protein is bad for your kidneys. And I've actually done several YouTube videos about this, explaining that this is a complete and utter myth. There's no research, definitely no controlled research that shows that a, a high protein diet, protein from any source, is bad for the human kidneys. And there's definitely no control research showing that protein from meat is in any way bad for kidneys. And so I've started using the, the, the phrase, meat is good for your kidneys. Prove me wrong. Show me the research. And until I've yet to have a single controlled research studies thrown in my face saying you're wrong, big guy, meat is bad for your kidneys. There is no research that shows that yet the average medical doctor, dietitian, nutritionist, they will, especially someone with stage one, two or three chronic kidney disease, they will scare them to death. Oh, you need to avoid, especially red meat. Somehow red meat's magical. It's much, much worse for your kidneys than, than you know, white meat. But OK, that's great. So where's the research? Oh, then you hear the crickets chirping because there is no research that supports that whatsoever, which makes that at best a hypothesis, at worst a myth or a big fat lie. Like I talk about in my book, uh, people with any medical condition, you're still a human being. You're still homo sapiens sapien. Therefore, you need to eat a human specific diet a proper human diet. And for every human on the planet, a proper human diet consists of a large percentage of fatty meat. And you ju until we've got some control research, you can't even argue otherwise. What about heart disease? Yeah. So heart, you know, red meat's going to cause a heart attack. Uh, eating red meat is going to raise your cholesterol. So the American Heart Association, which is the de facto world heart association, because most other countries take their walking orders directly from the American Heart Association when it comes to all matters heart related, they have stopped recommending a maximum amount of cholesterol intake in the diet. The research is oh, very clear. And, and the reason why you didn't know that, Michaela, is because they, they didn't have a press conference as they should have. They yeah. should have held a press conference and said, we know, we know, we've been recommending that you limit your cholesterol intake for decades, but the research doesn't support that. And it, it doesn't matter at all how much cholesterol you eat. Your body's going to make the amount of cholesterol you need. So we are no longer recommending that. That's That would have been the uh, ethical thing for them to do. Yep. Because what happens when they don't hold that press conference is we, even though the top cardiologists and the people that set the guidelines, they've stopped worrying about cholesterol intake in your diet. And they've stopped uh, recommending that to their personal patients. But we have this thing that I call the echo of the lie that I talk about in the book. So even though the preeminent authorities have stopped talking about that, they don't even, it's not even in there. If you print out their dietary guidelines, it's not in there anymore. But we still have all these doctors and dietitians and nutritionists and mothers and fathers who are saying, oh, don't yeah. eat cholesterol. It's bad for your heart. That's it. And it's idiotic. The, because it was a it was a weak hypothesis for a few decades, and it's been completely disproven. Even though the researchers were trying desperately to prove that it was a valid hypothesis, they yeah. failed miserably. And we've still got this echo of the lie that your hairdresser will tell you, that your aunt Betty will tell you. Oh, don't eat those the egg yolks; it, it's too high in cholesterol. But there's no research to support that. So uh, a lot of people listening to this will be like, you're telling me the American Heart Association said that cholesterol is no longer a, a molecule of concern when it comes to dietary intake? Yep. It's on page 187 of their guidelines buried in the minutia, but it's there. And so then, well, okay, well, then what about saturated fat? Eating saturated fat's bad for you. Yeah. Well, they've also stepped very quietly away from that recommendation as well. They, they don't really speak about, oh, if you eat too much saturated fat, that is a direct, directly causative of heart disease. No, actually, that's no longer in their guidelines either. But again, they didn't hold that, that press conference to let the world know. So we've got all these people who mean well, right? They mean very well, but they're just wrong. 
And uh, I, you un, uh, uh, any smart person understands that no matter how good your intentions are, if the information yeah. and teaching that you're giving is just wrong, you're going to do harm. And so there's all these people who are scared to death of ancestrally appropriate foods like egg yolks and fatty meat because they're afraid it will affect their heart because of the cholesterol or the saturated fat. And the world authority on all things heart related has stopped that recommendation. They don't even recommend that you limit cholesterol intake or limit saturated fat intake any longer, but they didn't have a press conference, so no one knows. What's that saying? Uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? Yeah, in this case, I think that's very applicable. Yeah, no, that's completely criminal, in my opinion. I agree. At what point do we have a young attorney out there who's hungry for a class action lawsuit? Or do we have an, an, an assistant DA in some state who's hungry to make a name for herself and who files a class action lawsuit against one of these organizations saying, hey, you're actually doing harm yeah by by not making public the fact that you no longer recommend that people limit cholesterol and and saturated fat intake because here's the harm that's being done there are all kinds of vitamins and minerals essential fatty acids that you really can only get from foods that are high in cholesterol and high in saturated fat and so if you're avoiding cholesterol and saturated fat you're not getting access to this, this, this cornucopia of vitamins and minerals and fatty acids that your body absolutely needs for essential, optimal human function. You might be able to limp along without these vitamins and minerals and fatty acids, but never will you realize your best health, your most optimal function. You, it's just not accessible to you because you're being restricted from these necessary nutrients. Yeah. I think a lot of people also have been sick for so long that they don't understand what it feels like to be healthy. Absolutely agree. It's it's human nature to get used to where we're at. Yeah. Right. And I and so you see this on both sides of the coin. When somebody's miserable every day, I didn't realize how good I could feel without joint yeah. pain and rosacea and, and severe heartburn and, and Dunlap. Do you know what Dunlap is, Michaela? Here in the South. It sounds that's, that's, horrifying. That, it, it is. It's when your belly is Dunlapped over your belt. That's a Southernism that we say here. And that means you're fat. I didn't, I didn't realize how miserable I was until I corrected all those things. But then on the flip side, people like you and I, now that we found our point on the spectrum of a proper human diet and we feel great every single day we kind of get used to that as well don't we and so it, it, it felt amazing at the beginning but then after 29 months of this it, it just feels normal to me now to feel great and to be able to go out and, and work on the farm and sweat two gallons out to, you know just non-stop manual labor that just feels normal to me and so I don't I don't I, you lose sight of just how bad or how good you feel I think that's just human nature I think it's human nature too. However, have you tried just doing like lion diet style for six weeks? Super strict. I have not. And I, 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 that is you on my agenda. You have to no, try. I agree. You have to try. Yeah, I agree because I feel great now, but could I feel even better? Exactly. That, no, I totally get the logic behind that. And at some point I'll, I'll probably do three months because I really feel like 90 yeah. days is what you really need for any dietary experiment to let your body have time to calm down and to improve. And at some point, I will do 90 days of just beef, salt, and water, and, and just see. Uh, and, you know, I may have to in include a little lamb in that. because I'm Lamb, I'm lamb. I eat lamb. mostly lamb. Very now. fond of lamb, and I like goat oatay. So I may just do 90 days of ruminant meat, ruminant salt, meat, and water. Yeah. yeah, and I may do that here, and I'll, I'll issue a, you know, a challenge to all my people when the time comes. Okay, cool. Keep me posted. I'll advertise that on my Instagram too, so people can join. That's fun. Uh, let's talk a little bit about transition symptoms you've seen from people going from, say, the standard American diet into an animal-based diet, what people should be prepared for. Yeah. So there are a couple of things that you need to un understand and also uh, be ready for. So the first thing, in my opinion, uh, highly processed carbohydrates are very, very addictive. 
They mimic all of the signs of addiction. Yeah, we, we can see uh, PET scan and, and MRI data in the nucleus accumbens, w- w- you know, which is basically the center that, of the brain that, that leads to addictive behavior. It lights up just like your smoking pot or smoking nicotine or smoking crack. It lights up the same way when you're eating highly processed carbohydrates or even thinking about eating them which is interesting, yeah. right? And so the first thing you're going to contend with is carbohydrate withdrawal symptoms. And a lot of people call this the keto flu or the carnivore flu. But when people are quitting smoking and they have the same exact symptoms of withdrawal, nobody calls that the the, the quitter's flu, that, right? Because you, you know that it's bad for you to smoke. So you, it doesn't matter what your symptoms of withdrawal are it's still worth it in the long run to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but food is so wrapped up in emotion, in religion, in family ties that we don't think of that the same way as we do tobacco, which obviously no one needs to smoke. No one needs to to do illicit drugs. No one needs to be an alcoholic. So there's there, we don't have all the social and emotional ties to those things. We can just single those out and say, that is bad for you. Stop that. But food's different, right? Because we have all these emotional strings attached to it. And so when you change your diet from the standard American crap processed diet to a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet, and you start to feel miserable, people immediately are going to jump to the conclusion, well, uh, duh, that diet's bad for you. You should go back to eating your regular diet. Instead of thinking, oh, maybe you're having withdrawal symptoms from the highly processed grains and the sugar content. Maybe you need to give that three to 14 days, just like the withdrawal from any other standard addictive substance for those signs and symptoms of withdrawal to abate, because that's exactly what you have to do. And some people, they don't have much withdrawal symptom. And these are usually people who are already eating paleo or trying to eat real whole foods. But if you're if you're going straight from carnivore from a standard American or a standard Canadian crap diet you're probably going to have three to seven days of withdrawal symptoms and it's going to suck. That doesn't mean you should stop. That means you should persevere until you get to the other side because that's where all the benefits are. The second thing that people need to be aware of is when you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, your insulin levels are staying chronically high. Your levels of chronic inappropriate inflammation are chronically high. That both of those things are going to make you store a lot of fluid, unhealthy fluid in your body, right? And so the way the human kidney works is when you start eating a very low carbohydrate diet, your blood sugar levels and your insulin levels are going to quickly return to normal. And that's going to cause a diuresis, which means that you're going to start to to urinate out all this unhealthy fluid that you've been storing inappropriately all over your body. But the way the human kidney works is you can't just urinate out free water. You have to have some degree of salt go with that water. You have to have some degree of magnesium and potassium and even calcium has to go with that water because of the way the human kidney is designed. And so you'll wind up with with uh, other symptoms of being not eating enough salt because we all been taught that salt is bad, which is another big fat lie that you don't have to worry about when you start eating a proper human diet. But for the first few days of this transition, you need to be very mindful that you're eating enough salt and you need to be very mindful that you're getting enough magnesium and potassium either in your diet or in the form of a supplement. And those things alone mitigate this, the side, the symptoms of, of carbohydrate withdrawal and just the, the keto flu or the carnivore flu that many people mislabel it as. It's just electrolyte fluctuations, salt fluctuations, and carbohydrate withdrawal. That's what you're suffering from. It's short-lived, it's temporary, and I promise you it is worth the three to seven days uh, transition period to get to the other side. For me... And for people I've seen who have really severe autoimmune disorders, that can be up to 21 days. Mm. The cravings I had and I and taken, I went from standard American diet to a very restrictive paleo diet to a keto diet with no dairy and no eggs to the carnivore diet over a period of like two years. And the cravings, the cravings were bad enough and they lasted three weeks for me where I was having dreams about these foods. Yeah. And it it was ridiculous. Every time I, so I didn't screw up because as soon as I cut out a food, I was like, I'm it's out. But 
occasionally I'd be somewhere and I'd have some contamination on something. And as soon as I had that contaminated food, all my cravings would come back. It was wild. Yep. And so it'd be like, I'd, I'd have something and there'd be soybean oil on it and I wouldn't know. And then I'd have soy cravings. Yep. It was crazy. And I think and the, uh, the other thing that caused your withdrawal, your cravings to last longer is your gut microbiome. And as I said earlier, we don't know nearly enough about this, but also you have a set of fungi that live in your gut as well. And, and people, most people aren't aware of that, but you have a, a micro fungome as well as a microbiome and fungi can have serious effects on your mental health. And so I, I opine, this is a, merely a hypothesis because nobody's studying this, but I think when you go from a high carbohydrate diet to a very, very low carbohydrate diet, your gut bacteria rebel because yeah. you are populated with a high carb loving a uh, bunch of bacteria in your gut. And all of a sudden they're not getting the sugar. They're not getting the highly processed grains and starches that they, they operate best on. And so they start to downregulate as well as protest. You can just imagine the little bacteria with their placards saying, <laughs> hell no, no more meat, right? But what you're also doing is upregulating all of the healthy beneficial bacteria and funguses that love a low carbohydrate, nutrient dense diet. And that can take a few weeks to, to get your gut bacteria yeah. and fungus regulated. And a lot of carnivores notice they'll have three days to three weeks of diarrhea. And that's part of their transition. And that's because that's that's the protestation of your gut bacteria yeah. and fungus saying, what the hell are you doing? Where's Where are my carbs? And, and I think also vegetable seed oils do play a role in that as well. And a lot of people don't understand the power that fungus can have over your actual mental activity. If no one's seen the, the video of the zombie ants where oh. a, a fungus literally makes this ant ignore all of its, its instinct and its training, climb to a top of a leaf, attach to a certain kind of leaf on a certain tree on a certain side of the tree, and then die and then fall to the ground so that the fungus can rep replicate in the ant's body. Yeah. Just search YouTube for uh, fungus ants. I'm going to link that it below. It's crazy. It's screwed up. It is. But that's the power that that fungi can have over seemingly sentient beings and make you literally become a zombie. And you're going to the fridge looking for the carbs. And yes. it's, it's completely against your will. But yeah, I think that's absolutely a thing. And I think that's something that our, our researchers at the Harvard School of Public Health, they need to start looking into that kind of stuff yeah. instead of, oh, every piece of bacon you eat shortens your life by seven minutes. Because they kind of played that. That's a that's a dead horse. They need to stop beating that and start looking at the effect that the microbiome and the fungus have on our behavior and changing our mental health. When I first went to paleo, that's when the cravings were the worst. And I could tell, I knew, because I've been doing research on the microbiome, even though there's not a lot to read out there that's le like legitimate exactly because it's so new, but I could tell that the cravings weren't mine. Like I'd be like, no, I'm on this diet. And they'd just be like, angel food cake would just appear in my head. <laughs> and I'd be like, what is that? What is that? And I'd be hungry, but I wouldn't be hungry for the food that was healthy. I'd just be hungry for the food that wasn't healthy. And I'd be like, well, then I'm not hungry. If like, if I only want to eat one food, but I don't want a steak, that's not actual hunger. That's exactly. So I just got angry at it. I was like, how dare you? Whatever is in me trying to control me. How dare you yep. starve? And that was very unpleasant. Absolutely. Okay. So I have your book. This is your older book yep. right here. Lies My Doctor Told Me, which is a great book, but... What is what is happening with this new book? So I'm I'm working on my my new book and it's tentatively titled The Proper Human Diet because I think that there is a spectrum that every single human on the planet if if they if their goal is to achieve optimal health, optimal function both physically and mentally you need to be eating on the proper human diet spectrum. I'm going to try to have it out by the new year. Um, that may or may not happen. I have a bit of ADHD, and so I, I tend to get distracted, but I am working diligently on that. I have a team working with me to kind of keep me focused. Uh, sometimes that's a challenge, 
But uh, mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a very important book, uh, perhaps even more important than Lies. Uh, when I wrote Lies, I, I was called to write that book. I, I, I could not sleep. I could not eat. Uh, Nisha basically... Uh, recounting the that the memories now she's like yeah I basically didn't see you for 18 months while you're writing that book and uh, I, I think that yeah. the proper human diet is going to wind up being a more important book that's going to be more helpful to even more people than lies was and I can't wait to get it finished but um, it's a work in progress okay well I'm looking forward to that this was a good one I mean I can tell why you felt like you were called to writing it medical myths that can harm your health there's probably an emotional aspect to that yeah well it's so it's such a convoluted complex topic because just think of the interaction in the average doctor's office here's a doctor who got received very little training on nutrition right Uh, on average in western medicine it's maybe a few hours of training and and then you they are looked upon by the patient as a an authority figure almost yeah. like a witch doctor. Like they know things I don't know. Anything that comes out of their mouth, I should consider gospel. I should do what they say. But the doctor not only doesn't know what the hell he or she's talking about when it comes to human nutrition on, on average, they don't know that they don't know. And yeah, and then they trust these preeminent authorities like the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, they trust these people just like the patient trusts them. So you've got this almost exponential, uh, just terrible trust problem. And it, it multiplies each step up the ladder you go. So not only is the doctor deluded and misled, then you multiply that by the doctor misleading and deluding the patient. So it, it just becomes almost a, an, a, an unsolvable puzzle of how yeah. the hell do you fix that interaction? But that that's the most important interaction is the, between the doctor and the patient. And that's why I wrote lies like I did so that we break it up into one topic. And this is what your doctor says, but this is the actual truth of the matter. And I think that I wrote it for patients, but if you notice, there's actually an entire chapter in the back dedicated to healthcare providers. Like this is this is what you're doing wrong. This is how you correct that. And that's why I've dedicated the remainder of my life to educating people. I'm not trying to change doctors' minds or healthcare providers. I don't give a damn what the ADA or the AHA thinks of me. I could care less. I'm trying to reach out directly to people and say, hey, I know your doctor told you this, but it's actually wrong. Try this instead. And I've got pretty good feedback from, you know, a few people. So I think that that model mm-hmm. is working very well. But it, it's really sad that that interaction has to go so wrong and has to just be just exponentially wrong. Because no one in that interaction, neither the doctor nor the patient, know the truth. And they also don't know the power of the truth. I mean, just for you and your dad, you know, absolutely all of these medical interventions, all of these prescription medications became moot when you discovered the power of proper nutrition, mm-hmm. species-specific nutrition, a proper human diet. When you became aware of that yourself, how many doctors did you did you render meaningless in your life when you made that adjustment and said, hey, maybe my diet's way more important than everybody thinks it is. It's not just about weight loss. It's about optimizing my health. How many doctors did you turn out to pasture personally when you discovered, oh my God, diet really matters a lot? A lot. (laughs) I had a lot of doctors. I had a lot of doctors. I had a rheumatologist, I had a psychiatrist, I had a family doctor. That was was three at least. Oh, and then I was going to see an immunologist for allergies. So that's four. Yeah. Oh, and, and a dermatologist for skin. So that's five. Yep. I bet you there was more, but there were definitely five. Yeah. So all of those very complex interactions that you were having with each different doctor and then the prescription that inevitably came from each different doctor, which added up for you as a handful of pills every day, multiple times a day. How powerful is that that you basically at some point just put up your hand and said, no, no more, no more. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to try a different path. And then all of a sudden, all of these things, all of these doctors, all of these pills, which to you at the time seemed mandatory. 
They, yeah, like life if, saving. If, if I'm going to have any kind of a life, I've got to see these doctors. I've got to take all these pills. Just they just magically melt away in importance. And I, I think I've seen that's replicated so many times in people on a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet. It's like, yeah, I'm off five pills. I'm off 10 pills. I'm off three pills. I used to have four doctors. Now I have one that I see once a year. And that's m- mainly just because I like hanging out with my doctor once a year. I don't really need him or her anymore. But that that is such an empowering thing. That moment when you hold up your hand and say, no more, I'm going to try a different path. It's scary initially, very scary. But just right before you make the decision and then right after the decision, it can be terrifying. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. I'm eating all this saturated fat and cholesterol now. But then when the benefits start to come, some come quickly, some take several months before you start to realize them. It's at that point, you know, no, I made the right decision. And I, I'm, I'm not anti-doctor. I'm not anti-medical uh, care. I'm just anti-unnecessary doctoring, unnecessary pharmaceuticals. That's, that's, that's the anti that I am, if you want to put a label on me. And I think many people in the keto and carnivore communities are now very anti medical intervention, unless it's absolutely necessary. Yes, I agree. Do you have words of comfort for people who are overweight or obese, who are concerned about increasing their meat intake and losing weight? Yeah. So (laughs) (laughs) carbohydrates are uniquely fattening for human beings. In in my research that I've been doing into not only human nutrition and human medicine, but also archaeology, anthropology, and even paleoanthropology, it's become quite obvious to me that human beings are by design or by evolution, low carbohydrate mammals. That's just what we are. And so anyone who's eating over 100 total grams of carbohydrates a day, you're going to have some degree of hyperinsulinemia, some degree of inappropriate chronic inflammation. And it may manifest in your skin. It may manifest in your gut, in your joints, in your hair. Uh, There are any number in your mental health, right? We all tend to express the inappropriate inflammation and hyperinsulinemia different parts of our body. And that's why initially a lot of people don't see the connection between all of these chronic medical conditions and diets because we manifest them in different ways. But once you start to lower the carbohydrate intake, you're gonna immediately start to notice improvements. And a lot of people lose inches before they lose pounds or kilograms. And so I always recommend people mm-hmm. take your measurements when you when you start keto or when you start carnivore, because the scale may not move for weeks or even months, but you're going to steadily be losing inches as the inflammation and, and the unhealthy water, you lose that. And as you start to burn fat, because it, it's been my experience that when you start a, a, a fatty meat, heavy keto diet or a carnivore diet, you're going to naturally start to put on muscle. And I've heard this from thousands of people, uh, feedback. It's like, I'm not working out at all, but but I'm noticing more muscle definition. Is that normal? And at first yeah. I thought that was completely anecdotal and crazy. But after you hear something from 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 people, you have to give some respect and credence to all those anecdotal experiences, right? Also, you're, you're eating a diet that's full of all the ingredients to build muscle and to build stronger bones. And people don't realize when they say, I want to lose weight, what they mean is I want to lose fat. That's what you mean by that. You don't want to lose bone density. You don't want to lose muscle. You don't want to lose cartilage, ligament, fascia. And so you start to actually build up all those vital organs. Your bones get stronger. Your muscles get stronger. Your, your fascia, which is, which is its own organ in the human body, starts to get tougher and stronger ligaments tendons cartilage all this stuff starts to get stronger that's going to show up on the scale so as you're losing stored fat you're actually gaining these other things and so for weeks you can actually break even on the on the bathroom scale and think this diet's not working for me at all but if you're taking your measurements you unlock that information you're like oh my god yeah i've lost three inches off my waist even though the scale hasn't moved and so it it can be For some people, the the benefits and the the weight loss is immediate. For other people, it takes longer. And so I would would say you're now eating a proper human diet. How can that not be good for you 
at least in the long term, if not in the short term. So stick with it. And this diet works equally well for people who are underweight. And, and, and a lot of people are surprised when I say keto and carnivore are not weight loss diets. That's not what they are. When I first started this seven, eight years ago, I 100% believed that, that keto was, a, was a, a temporary weight loss hack because that's all I knew at that time. But now seeing this in totality, I realize no, if you're underweight, if you suffer from an eating disorder or, or anything, mm -hmm. you can actually gain weight but you're not going to gain fat. You're going to gain muscle. You're going to gain bone density. You're going to gain all the, the beneficial organs are going to actually fill out and resume their normal appearance. And I've seen people gain 20, 30, 40 pounds of needed weight on both a ketogenic and a carnivore diet. Yeah. It seems to just normalize your weight. Exactly right. But it, it moves your body weight to a proper weight for you because it is a proper human diet. That's what it should do, right? That is what it should do. So if anyone isn't aware, what? It, how do you define a keto diet? So a keto diet for me is definitely going to be under 50 total grams of carbohydrates a day. For most people, especially if you have two, uh, lots of stored fat that you need to burn off and lose, it probably needs to be under 20 total grams of carbohydrates a day. And I think that Total carbs, that's a big deal because, as you know, keto is becoming very, very popular. And a lot yeah. of the big food manufacturers are jumping into the keto space. And if you let them count net carbs, they can trick you with, with soluble fibers and by misnaming things. And a friend of mine did an experiment. She was eating under 20 net grams of, of carbs a day. And she was eating over 100 grams of total carbs a day but still getting less than 20 net. And so the, the big what, food, why, so how is that different? What's the difference between net and total? So total carbs means counting every carb, including fiber, because many of the fibers, some fibers are insoluble and you truly don't absorb them and get any carbohydrates from them at all. Many fibers are soluble fibers and you will at least partially digest those with your gut. And so um, tapioca fiber, uh, oat fiber, corn fiber, a lot of these fibers are soluble fibers, but most people don't know the difference, right? The average customer. And so mm -hmm. they just see fiber and they think, boom, fiber, that's good. I've heard my doctor told me that I need fiber. So there you go. But uh, a lot of it, so corn fiber and tapioca fiber and oat fiber, you're going to get about two grams of carbs from each, from each gram. Uh, you're going to get, I see. For, you see what I'm saying? You're going to get two grams of carbs out of that four grams. And, and you're like, oh, wait a minute. I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's right. And the big food manufacturers, they know you don't know the difference. So they'll fill their, uh, their fake keto foods up with lots of soluble fiber. And then on the, the nutrition information panel, they get to call that fiber, not sugar, and, and say, oh, that doesn't count because that's fiber. Yeah, it's, it's very insidious. What? It's, it's very disappointing. But of course, big food manufacturers, they have a duty to their board of directors to make a profit. They have no duty to the customer to increase their health or improve their health, right? So they're they're actually doing their job, but their job is not to help you be healthier. And that's why I talk about total carbs, because you cannot play reindeer games with total carbs. It either is a carbohydrate or it ain't a carbohydrate. And so if people are really serious about doing a 180 with regards to their health, you got to count total carbs. And that's very unpopular, especially with, you know, keto influencers who are uh, either manufacturing keto treats or who are endorsing keto treats because that, that shoots their keto treat in the head when you start counting total carbohydrates. Okay. You just said play reindeer games. Yeah. Yeah. You know how, how the, the, the reindeer wouldn't let Rudolph play any reindeer games, right? <laughs> oh so, yeah. Reindeer okay. game is basically okay. just a bullshit game of semantics or, you know, a con, uh, you know, uh, uh, so, so yeah, they'll play all the games they can with the nutrition facts. They'll call sugar organic cane juice and they'll say, Oh, oh I've seen that. Yeah, exactly. That's a reindeer game. That's, uh -uh. I guess, I guess that's just a personal thing. I say, I thought I everybody like that. said that. Yeah. Yeah. But they'll do that for a profit because their their goal is not to make you healthier. It's to make the, the bottom line healthier. OK, and so I also think a ketogenic diet, every bite of food you put in your mouth needs to be nutrient dense. 
That's why we eat. We don't eat, but we shouldn't eat for just pleasure. Every bite of food should be meaningful nutrition, right? I think every bite of food you eat should be a real whole food with one ingredient. The, these are all my, my definitions of a ketogenic diet. Uh, you might be able to use keto cookies and cakes and pies and bars and shakes to transition to a, a ketogenic diet. Yeah. But ultimately, if your goal is optimal health, your, your diet on keto is going to consist of a lot of fatty meat, some kale or, or broccoli, and a few blueberries. That's, that's keto. If you're, if you're making keto cakes and pies, that's, that's kind of keto simulacra. That's, that's, it may, and it might help you transition, but that is by no means a proper human diet. Okay, I agree. There's a good differentiation there. Uh, I know I know a lot of people who've transitioned from the standard American diet who do have an easier time going, okay, I'm not eating pizza anymore, but I'll have like keto pizza or paleo pizza. And it cuts out a lot of the super, super, super harmful ingredients, exactly. but it's not a way to, so it's a way to transition or for kids who are really used to the standard American diet and used to eating like sugar all the time, yep. you can switch them onto keto treats and they'll like hardly notice. But after a month of doing that, they'll be more inclined because the withdrawal will like taper down. They'll be yep. more inclined to go to whole foods. That's exactly. And I think another thing that the average person does not know, the average doctor doesn't know is that you can actually train or retrain your palate. There are so many people in the U S especially yeah. who the they're, they only know chicken, chicken strip, breaded chicken strips and ketchup and, and Coke or Pepsi. That, and that's literally all the taste they can taste. They cannot taste the sweet. That was me. Yeah, I swear that was me. 100%. It's very common, but people aren't aware of this. So they don't know this happens. And so they'll initially say, no, I don't like meat. And I'm like, oh, you 100% like meat. You just don't know it yet because you're used to your breaded chicken strips with sugar filled ketchup and a Coca Cola. And then, you know, a little Debbie snack cake at the end. That's what you're used to. But you can actually retrain the human palate. And it's, you know, it's preferably you don't want to do that. So you start a baby out like we did Beckett with beef ribs and uh, ground beef. That was that was the first foods that went in his mouth. And so he's loved meat from day one. Yeah. But yeah. many children don't get that opportunity. They're raised on the little Rice crispy things and the little wheat crackers. And so they never develop a true broad human palate that can enjoy lots of different subtlety in the taste yeah. and the flavors. And one thing that I tell people is when you eat a raw almond, does it taste sweet to you? And if someone, if they haven't been on keto for long or they haven't, they're not uh, keto adapted, they're like, sweet. No, what are you talking, an almond? You mean, I mean, if it's like a candied almond, yeah. But I'm like, no, no, no. Almonds are very sweet. And when yeah. you taste that, you know that you're retraining your palate. Your palate is learning. Oh, there are much more subtle flavors than just sweet, sour, and salty. There are way hundreds and hundreds of layers of, of the palate that you can redevelop by slowly transitioning to eating real human food. And when, when, a, when an almond tastes sweet to you, you know you're on the proper path. You know you're moving in the right direction. I found that for me, when I switched from standard American diet to a paleo diet and the paleo was really, it was basically keto, right? Mm -hmm. it, it was, it was almost keto. Uh, it took three months. So for the first three months, everything I ate was terrible. I was making stews that I would later really appreciate, but it was like parsnips and carrots mm -hmm. and beef. And I was just like, this is horrible, like repulsive. There's no flavor here. Everything's kind of bitter. The meat's bland. And it was like that for three months. And then slowly carrots started to taste sweet and then parsnips were sweet. And I was yeah. like, parsnips are sweet. I didn't know that. Uh, then I went to meat and greens and I did that for a year. And I started to be able to differentiate between the different types of lettuces. I was like, oh, no, no, no. I want the sweet lettuce. Like I that, that's the sweet lettuce. I was like, what is going on? Uh, yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And the human tongue is capable of that. But most people don't know that at all. They don't know they have that. It's kind of a superpower to be able to differentiate yeah. between types of lettuce just by the taste. But yeah. <laughs> people don't realize they have that superpower. It is undiscovered currently. Did your did your sense of smell change? Yeah, my uh, and so in in two ways, my sense of smell changed. Not only did I become much more acutely aware of smells and able to differentiate smells, but also my personal smell 
improved oh, greatly. Yeah. yeah, my body odor has gotten so much better on a carnivore diet. And that's something I don't think is talked about enough. But I think that speaks directly to how the diet affects your skin microbiome and, and your odor. And so humans are supposed to have odors, but we're not supposed to smell like a dead cat. <laughs> if we don't take a bath every six hours, right? But many people notice I've got to take two showers a day or I smell like asshole. And that <laughs> the reason is, is your diet is not right. You're selecting yeah. for the wrong skin bacteria that are very uh, malodorous. And that, that's why you stink. My brother or my sister, it's not because just you stink. It's because you're eating a diet that's yeah. proper. Yeah, I found, uh, I also think it's your body trying to get rid of food. So when I tried to reintroduce soy, and I, I had like no body odor, totally fine on yep. paleo, and I tried to reintroduce soy, and during the reaction when my, my arthritis came back, my skin broke out, I had like horrifying doom, my digestion was upset, I had terrible body odor. Yep. And I noticed if I got in a sauna and kind of sweated it out, then it would get a little bit better. So I think it's also your body being like, get this out of me, whatever yep. you're eating. It could absolutely be that. Uh, or it could be you're, you re up regulating your skin microbiome to the, to the previous unhealthy one. It, either, either one or a combination could absolutely be the case. Yeah. Okay. So if people are interested in this, is there an easy, like first, do you tell people to jump right in and just do it and get through the withdrawal and get through the electrolyte up and down, or is there a way to transition in more smoothly? It depends on the person, Michaela. It, some people are teetotalers. Like it sounds like you're kind of like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm either yeah, all I in or I'm not going to do it. If you're that type of person, the, and and you're aware that you're probably going to have some carbohydrate withdrawal symptoms for a few days, you're probably going to have some diarrhea for a few days. There's no danger whatsoever to just going from from day zero to day one to a 100% carnivore diet, even a lion diet. That's in no way dangerous. Uh, you may feel like crap for a few days, but if you if you understand the, the physiology of why you feel like crap, you understand it's worth it to stick with it. Other people are, are kind of incremental improvers, right? They can't, they're not teetotalers. And so for those people, I think it's perfectly fine to transition slowly and to use all the keto products as a transition tool and then to slowly tighten up from dirty keto or lazy keto to doing a more real whole food, one ingredient keto, and then to transition from there to carnivore if you feel like you need to. Yeah, I've noticed that uh, this has been my experience talking to people specifically with serious autoimmunity is that some of those people have pretty bad transition symptoms because initially I was saying just jump in because you're going to heal the fastest, the fastest you get on the diet. So even if the withdrawal and, and the transition symptoms are a bit worse, it's still worth it in the long run. But then there were a couple of people and you talked about potassium, sodium, magnesium. There were a couple of people who didn't regulate their electrolytes and ended up super faint yep. with like serious like sodium disbalances yep. uh, because they didn't increase their electrolytes first thing in the diet. So I think jumping right in, if you're, if you've done your research and you're aware that you probably need to take, I, I, ha I was taking almost 2000 milligrams of sodium a day to regulate my electrolytes for quite a while until my body got used to it. Like maybe like a year and a half. It took a long time for me. But I think if you can mitigate those effects, then the sooner the better. I agree. Hopefully. I agree. But different people have different methods of transition. And I think that if they're if they are self-aware enough to know which kind of person they are, yeah. then they should definitely use that to their advantage during the transition process, whether it's a teetotaler or an incremental. Because if you don't honor who you are as a person during the transition, your risk of failure skyrockets, right? Because you're not, you're not following the path that you should be following. And so I think it's important for people to try to understand which, which kind of person am I? Yeah, I agree. Okay, Dr. Barry, you've kind of downplayed the size of your YouTube channel. How many subscribers do you have right now? I think I have 1.6 million YouTube subscribers uh, on my channel, which I'm very thankful for. I'm very grateful for. I had no idea when when my wife Nisha shamed me into starting a YouTube channel 
I had no dream that it would ever become what it's become, but I'm very grateful for that. And I'm, I'm grateful that I've had the opportunity to help so many people who I've never met to, you know, and I get, I get comments all the time on the videos. It's like, you've helped me lose this much weight and I've reversed these chronic medical conditions. And I no longer am contemplating having a knee replacement surgery because my knee doesn't yeah. hurt anymore, that kind of stuff. And that stuff to me, that's, that is payment. That is, that is better than money. That's better than accolades from the American Medical Association who can, they can kiss my ass, by the way. Uh, that, that's the, that's what keeps me going every day is, is the feedback from people who saying, who saying you have changed my life for the better. Okay. So other than your YouTube channel, what's your YouTube channel called, by the way? Uh, Ken D. Berry, MD. But I think if you just search for Dr. Berry, you'll, you'll find me. Do you find it funny that your last name is Barry? It is funny. And, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> somebody made a, a, a graphic of, of me, Dr. Barry, and then uh, Dr. Sean Baker, and then Dr. Paul Salad Eno. And they're like, it's funny that the three carnivore doctors all have carbs in their name. And I think that's also funny, but probably that's not. That's very funny. funny. I find that very funny. Okay. You're also on Instagram, right? Yeah, when I'm, when I'm feeling especially uh, loving and kind, I'll, I'll post on Instagram. When I'm feeling <laughs> especially snarky, I'll post on Twitter. Um, I'm, I'm currently most proud of my uh, growth on my TikTok. Uh, it, I, I think TikTok is going to be the next big thing. Yeah, for sure. I still don't understand it, but I'm trying really hard to master it. Uh, I'm also I'm on all social media because, as I said in the beginning, my mission is to help as many people as I can reclaim their best health. And the only way I'm going to do that is to reach out to people. And the, currently the way you do that is with social media. Okay. Well, I definitely recommend anybody listening, if they're interested in these kind of diets, uh, to follow Dr. Ken Berry. I've been following him for a while and he knows what's up. So thank you very much for coming on. That was a fun conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for having Good luck me. with the book. Good luck with the book coming out too. Yeah. No, don't, don't tell me good luck, Michaela. Tell me to get my ass in gear. Uh, I need some. Do it. It'll help a lot of people. And yeah. also try that. You know what? Try the lion diet first, then do the book. And ah. then you can see the difference just in case. Like, what if you're only operating at 80% right now and you don't yeah. even know it? That, that's a, a valid point. I will. I'm going to, I'm going to put that on the schedule. Okay. 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 I'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.